Good morning, Point Church. You know, normally I have the privilege of speaking to you in person, but as many of you know, Lisa's mom passed away and we've traveled to California to honor her life, attend her funeral. Uh, we'll be back later tonight. At least his mom and dad, they, they played an instrumental role in providing financial help in the early years of the Point Church. And I, I know the Lord's looked into her eyes and said, well done, good and faithful servant. She was a fantastic Christian woman. So today, really, in this series of talking about incredible families, at least and I were doing our best to live out what we teach by taking the time to celebrate and honor God for Lisa's mom's life. So thank you for being so understanding and for, for being here on a day when we try something new, a message via video. I mean, this is the first time ever. Today, we're talking about strengthening your family. Any of you parents here today? Do you love your kids? Yeah, I love kids. You love kids. I mean, they're sweet. They're cuddly. They're nice until they're not. And you got to parent them. You know what parenting is like? Parenting is like you're drowning and somebody throws you four kids instead of a lifeline. You ever feel like that? You're just managing being an adult, you know, paying your bills and all that. And then somebody throws you kids. Hey, try living life now, sucker. You know, today from the ancient wisdom of scripture, I want to give you seven essentials for transforming your family's house into a Christian home. You see, it's possible for two Christian parents to be in a house together, but never lead a Christian home. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're going to make a Christian home. And we're not talking about a perfect home. There's no such thing. You know, I thought my home would be perfect, but then my wife married me, <laughs> who needed a lot of work. Perfection, it doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen in any home. So today we're going to look at how to lead a Christian home in the real world in reality. And God gives us seven essentials to pull that off. Turn in your Bibles or in your message notes to Joshua. This guy was a remarkable national leader, but he didn't just lead a nation. He led his own home. Look at Joshua 24, 15. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15 says, if you decide that it's a bad thing to worship God, then choose a God that you'd rather serve and do it today. Choose one of the gods your ancestors worship from the country beyond the river or one of the gods of the Amorites or one whose land you're now living. But as for me and my family, Joshua says, we're going to worship God. I want you to notice the two halves of Joshua's speech. The first half, it's kind of like a state of the nation speech, you know, addressing other families who may be wavering on how to lead their home. And, and he tells them, you got to choose between all the other stuff that your house could be about. You know, the little G gods out there and the big G. And the second half, he simply says, well, I've made my choice. My house, my house is about the big God. And he says, you guys choose what your house is about. I love you. But, but if you're doing the little G God stuff, we ain't following you. We're living for the Lord. So how do you do that? How do you make a Christian home? Well, there's seven essentials. The first of which is in Matthew 6, 33. Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. If you want to transform your house into a Christian home, the first essential is that Christ has to be first. Would you write that down? This is obvious, I know, but it's not easy because there's always a fight for first. You know, it's kind of like playing shotgun. Any of you guys grow up playing shotgun? Maybe your kids play it. You say as a parent, hey, we're going to school, we're going to the Y, we're going to church, we're going somewhere. And then there's this mad rush, right, to, to ride in the front seat, right, next to the driver in shotgun position. I discovered the other day that there are actually rules for calling shotgun. Have you seen this website, shotgunrules.com? They've formalized the rules. Rule 1.1. I mean, this is pretty simple. To ride shotgun, you've got to say the word shotgun clearly and loud enough so that at least one other person riding in the vehicle can hear you. Here's rule 1.3. It says that you've got to be outside to call shotgun. Not in your kitchen or still in the store or in church. you got to be where the rain can fall on your head. That's the law, right? And rule 2.1 puts the focus on your footwear. You can't call shotgun until you got your shoes on. You can't be running out of the house with your Nikes in your hand. That's illegal. God will not like it. It can lead to physical violence. Yes, there's always a fight for first. You know, years ago, God called shotgun. And he said these words in the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Friends, you want a life that works? 
A family that works? God says, you put me first. Now here's the reality. What determines first? Can we be a little philosophical here, church? There, were, there was this French dude who made a living in Holland spewing philosophy. His name was Descartes. And he said, I think, therefore, therefore what? Yeah, church, you thought you didn't know any philosophy, but you know Descartes, you uppity church spouting off your intellect, people. Descartes says, I think, therefore, I am. So what Descartes was teaching was that you are what you think. But he was wrong. Jesus contradicts Descartes. Jesus says, I love, therefore I am. Jesus taught you are what you love. You see, we're more than what we think. We are what we love. Every one of us has something on the throne of our affection. Something has our heart. And we chase it. We get caught up in it. Jesus said, Mark 12, 30, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. What Jesus says is chase me. Follow me. He says in Matthew 6, 21, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, in the medieval cities of Europe, the cities were built around their place of worship, the cathedral. This is Strasbourg Cathedral, built in 1439 on the French-German border in the city of Strasbourg. Everything in the city was built around this church. It was the place of worship, the place of learning, the very heart of the city. That's how people thought back then. That's how communities were developed. But 500 years later, we enter a new age, the rational age, and people thought, eh, we don't need a center of worship because we're beyond God. And they didn't realize that they're made in the imago Dei, the image of God, which means if you don't worship God, you're going to worship something else. So soon, new worship centers were built. We call them malls. The mall became the 20th century place of worship, the weary seeker whose soul longed for it. Nike or Abercrombie or Nordstrom's could find whatever his heart sought in the great American mall. Throngs of worshipers would join him as economic priests serving at financial altars called registers would miraculously transform plastic cards into bags full of stuff. And the cathedral was out and the mall was the new center of the city. And of course today, the mall too has lost its place. The heart of our worship today is now focused on a tiny device that goes wherever we go. A mobile phone that's become the center of our being, the longing of our heart, the focus of our time. The cathedral, the mall, they're gone. The iPhone, the droid, that's the new center of worship. And against the principle, something's got to be first. Well, what determines first? It's whatever you love. And Jesus wants to win that affection. John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Don't love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that comes not from the Father, but from the world. It's kind of like this. There are two young fish swimming along, and they bump into an older fish swimming the opposite way. And the old fish, he kind of nods at them and says, Hey, good morning, boys. How's the water? And the two young fish swim past the old fish and one of them looks over to the other and says, what in the world is water? Friends, sometimes you and I are so immersed in our environment that we don't even realize what we're swimming in. But John says, hey, Christian people, you know you're supposed to put Christ first, but you're having an affair with this thing called the world. And you're so immersed in it, so saturated with it, that you don't even realize how far you've drifted from God. Friends, our Western version of Christianity has become so detached from first century Christianity that it's kind of like getting a flu shot. We've got just enough religion to inoculate us from the real thing. Christianity, it's become a side thing. It's become a Sunday morning thing. It's not a big deal in our week. It's not the center of our life. And friends, here's the rub. The kids know. They know. They know what you really worship. And they know what the home is centered on. And they know this Jesus thing, this Point Church thing, it's just a side thing. They know Jesus isn't first. But God says, I've got to be first. For your home to work, I've got to be first. So I want to ask every parent here, and every aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa, friend of the family, is God first in your life? Because if he is not, do not expect your kids to put him there. You're the model. You're the example. 
you know, I remember when my boys were small and we were getting on an escalator at this shopping center in Sacramento. Have you ever tried to get on an escalator with a toddler? I mean, it could be a disaster. Believe me, I know. I discovered the wrong way. The wrong way is try to put the kid on first. I'm with Brad, he's like barely walking. And I try to put him on the escalator first and he looks up at me mortified. Like, dad, these steps are moving. They're like 18 inches from my face. And he spreads out his feet and his arms and his whole body and he says, I'm not getting on that thing, right? And the ground is moving, spitting out metal bricks of death. Well, I try to lift Brad up a bit, you know, to get him started. And it was carnage. He fell, I fell, the people behind us fell. You familiar with domino theory? We got a mall full of people piling up on my family while I grope for the emergency stop button. Listen, any of you parents of toddlers here in the house today, you want a parenting tip? When you want to ride an escalator with a toddler, the key is to ignore the kid. Just hold their hand, but don't look at them. Get on the escalator first and don't look back. Don't let go and guess what'll happen? It's amazing. They just get on. Go experiment. Try it today at Glenbrook Mall. It always works. And friends, this is how it works with God. God says, put me first. And all the other things in your life are going to fall into place behind me. But if you put anything else ahead of me, eventually you're going to collapse and carnage will follow and you'll be constantly looking for a red emergency stop button. Listen, there is nothing, nothing more important. You've got to put Christ first. The second thing, that you got to do to get a God working in your home is in Ecclesiastes 9.9. Turn there. It says, relish life with the spouse you love and every day of your precarious life because each day is God's gift. Would you write this down? I must create great atmosphere. You know, this one woman, she's peering out of the window of her house at the new neighbors that, you know, they just moved in across the street. And she noticed every night the husband would come home and as soon as his wife opened the door, he would gather her up in his arms, give her a huge hug, huge kiss, and present her with a bundle of flowers. And after watching this for the, uh, this whole week, uh, this woman burst out at her husband and, and she said, have you noticed the new neighbors? Have you seen how the, how the husband greets his wife? Every night he gives her a hug, a kiss and flowers. Why can't you do that? And the husband looks at her and says, well, honey, I don't even know that woman. Listen, every one of us gets to set the atmosphere in our home. Creating a good atmosphere means two things. First, establishing clear authority in my home. You know, Ephesians 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Listen, sometimes obedience is missing. Sometimes kids rebel against the rules. But many times, it's the rules themselves and the lack of authority that's missing. Establishing authority and rules, it's vital to creating a great atmosphere. Do you know every fun place that you go in life is fun? Not because it has no rules, not because it's anarchy, but because there are expectations. You ever go to a water park? It's a blast, but they have rules. I mean, you got to wear a swimsuit. You can't just go sliding down in a tuxedo. Everywhere that's fun has rules and somebody who's enforcing them. Can I just speak to the dads here today? You know, authority is a big deal for us dads. You know, men like to be in charge. You know, I'm in charge of my home. I know that because Lisa told me I could be. Uh, truth is, friends, all Christian dads report to Christ. Proverbs 3, 6 says, in all your ways, you're going to submit to him. In other words, men, if you think of yourself as the big boss, got to think again. There's only one boss in a Christian home, and that's Jesus Christ. And as we gain our authority from Christ, so authority then is present in the home like Christ is present in your heart and ensuring that kids are safe and they know the rules are enforced. You see, when you care enough to enforce the rules in your home, your kids are never going to tell you this, but secretly they like it because they know deep down you actually care. Yeah, I know there's a balance. Ephesians 6 tells us fathers don't make your children bitter about life. Instead, bring them up in Christian discipline and instruction. And on the flip side of establishing authority is the second part to creating atmosphere. And that is providing lifelong affection. You know, the world of a kid, it's full of some unhealthy touches. And sometimes it comes at the hands of a bully, sometimes from somebody much worse. You know, kids need moms and dads who hug and kiss them. And I don't care what size and age they are. Sometimes I care if, you know, they haven't showered in the past week. But, but kids need hugs and kisses even as they grow up into teenagers 
and adults. And this is a great counterbalance to the discipline that authority figures have to dish out. You know, a kid can take a consequence much easier from a parent who's always loving on them. Someone physically distant, not so much. Some of you, you guys do really well at this when kids are small. But then you start feeling weird about it when they hit puberty. Listen, get over it. They don't feel weird about you, but they can sense that you're pulling away at a time when they need your affection most. So put your work down, put your phone down, wrestle those kids to the ground, dads, if that'll help you hug them. But just be sure they get affection regularly from you. You know, one more thought on atmosphere. Sometimes we dads, we like to swing for the fences. We think, well, I'll just take off work and I'll take everybody to Disney. Well, great, do that. But most of the time, you're really just lying to yourself. You're putting off the job of making your family fun. Listen, the family you've got is the one you got. The resources you've got are the resources you got. You got to use what you got. You know, some of the best memories I have of my dad is not when he took me to NFL games, but really the times when he stepped out into the street and played two-hand touch football with us. Some of the best memories I have of my mom are not from expensive trips, but from the times where she got us boys sitting at the table making gingerbread houses and decorating cookies. Listen, you don't have to break the bank to turn up the joy in your house. Just be creative. Be present. Third thing you need to do today to get God working in your home. And by the way, this is the last one we're going to cover today. Part two of this message is next week. This one's found in Deuteronomy 6. The Bible tells us this. It says, these are the commands and decrees and the laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess so that you your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. So number three is to clarify values. Would you write that down? Clarify values. Listen, kids are a gift from God. Do you believe that? Absolutely. We all believe that, but it's not a cheap gift. <laughs> you know, here in Indiana, the average cost of raising a child from birth to to age 17 is $253,280.13. I don't know why that data comes from the Department of Agriculture, but I'm serious. I mean, this figure's from a USDA report. <laughs> Perhaps it's just how much my kids drink in milk each day. I don't know. You know in fact, the other day, my boys are out for a walk and they met a guy, he's about my age, who had a Ferrari and a Lamborghini parked in his garage. He's a collector. And Trevor and Ethan were like, Dad, where's your Ferrari? Where's your Lambo? And I'm like, boys, my exotics are standing right in front of me. They're like, oh, Dad. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm just glad I had boys. Because that quarter mil per kid, I think it doubles for girls. You know, kids are costly, but kids are valuable. And there's really three ways that kids catch our values. And really only one of them is trustworthy. The first is from Romans 12, 2. It says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. You see, our culture, it has a value pattern, and they want to impose it on our kids. You know, kids tell us, but mom, but dad, everyone says, everyone's doing it. You know, so you can get your values from external sources. Would you write that down? You can get your values from external sources. But taking a poll isn't how a Christian family sets their values. You know, the second source of values is indicated in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. The Bible says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. You know, sometimes our own thoughts and feelings, they impress values upon us. You got external sources, and now there's some internal sources. I remember talking to this one dad. He'd gone out on his wife, and when I talked to him, I really expected that he'd just be crushed, you know, kind of repentant about it. But he wasn't. He said, you know, Ray, I think I found my soulmate. I said, no, you didn't. You're not being led by God. You're being led by your feelings. And your feelings have deceived you. Listen, when you go with your thoughts and your feelings, you can pretty much justify doing anything. 
Well, what's the best source for values? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. This is not an external source. This is not an internal source. This is an eternal source. It's eternal. The word of God above me. And God says that, and it's so important, parents. We've got to hold to the word of God, because when you hold to God's word, it provides the cement that brings your family together. You know, the world changes, the world fluctuates, but the word of God remains firm in every single generation. God says, I want you to get my words in your heart. And that means, you know, opening up the Bible app or getting out a real Bible every day. Listen, you want a better family? Read the book, people. Start it with a chapter every day. Let me tell you what I did with my boys. When I got up, I'd read a chapter of Proverbs every day. It takes me about two, three minutes. And as I read it, I'd ask God to point out one verse and, and kind of like make it bold or put it in color for me. You know, the verse that he wants me to hear that day. And, and when God did that, I would just say it out loud a few times. And then when I would take my youngest three sons to school, I would tell them my verse of the day. Kind of like a daddy bird dropping a little meal into the baby bird's mouths, you know. And some days, I'm telling you, that verse provided some fuel for conversation en route to school. And other days, my kids are like, oh, this is what it's like to have a preacher for a dad. Listen, I challenge you adults. Proverbs has 31 chapters. Today is February 2nd. Tomorrow, open up Proverbs to chapter 3 and read it. You'll be done in three minutes. Pick a verse. Make that verse your verse of the day. Tell it to your kids. Share it with a friend. Let God speak to you through that verse. Church, you've got to eat from the Word of God more than just one day a week. Otherwise, you're going to be a spiritual wimp your whole life. Feed on the Word of God, friends, and I guarantee you, you'll grow wiser, you'll grow stronger, and your kids are going to see how they can live this out too. Listen, parents, you've created an eternal soul. What do you think about that? Young couple, they get married, and after a little while, they go look at each other and they, they go, oh, things are perfect, right? Things are quiet. We should have a baby. I mean, nobody ever says we should have a teenager. <laughs> they want a baby, right? And now they've got no idea what they're really saying. But friends, we all need to realize that when you decide to have a baby, you're really partnering with God in the creation of an eternal soul. Did you hear that? An eternal, forever soul is created. And when you have that child, you're responsible for that child. Your kids... They may not be reading the Bible, but friends, they're reading you. They're seeing your faith at this moment in time. And they're noticing and filing away the values that you have in your life. You want them to be incredible physically and academically, but friends, look at the number one thing that you should want them to be. Look at how you want them to be spiritually. Don't make the mistake of sacrificing everything for their grades or for their sports. I mean, that's parental malpractice. You got to be careful that you're teaching them to worship God and play sports. If you're not, you might end up teaching them to worship sports and play God. Listen to me. You got to start with God. You got to connect them to a church. You got to make sure they're in spiritual community because that's going to set them up with a spiritual discipline that will never leave them for the rest of their lives. Values are modeled. What we say, they're going to forget. But what we do, what we model will serve our kids for life. Hey, you've been fantastic. Paying attention to a brand new medium. Thank you so much for trying this with us. I'd love to hear your feedback on how that worked, but let's do this right now. I'm going to ask one of our pastors to come and lead us in prayer. I can't wait to get back next week and take on the second half of this. Are you going to come back? I'll try to be here myself. Hey, uh, let's take this time to honor our God together. Let's pray together. Would you bow your heads as we pray?